Hey, everybody, it's Richard Harrison Scott Lease with another episode of the Serpent Sales Podcast, uh, brought to you in the month of February by Wingman, Lead 411, Salesforce Revenue Cloud, and Vidyard. So, we are super excited when those people support us as you are building out your sales stack and revenue stack. I think we're going to have to change that word from sales stack now to the revenue stack. Yeah. Uh, officially, we've crossed, we've crossed copyrighted, copyrighted right here. Um, these are the, some of the people who can help you do that. And we're super excited because actually we have the founder and CEO of another amazing tool that people should be putting in their revenue stack. Um, if you aren't, you're late to the party. Uh, so with us today is the one and only David Cancel. So David, thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're, we've been waiting for a while to get you on the call. So thank I know. You. I'm excited to be here, see? Yeah. Scott, you didn't know this, but but David just got off the red-eye flight from Cabo. So, um, well, know. I would say, you know, thanks so much for <laughs> staying and, and, and being here and making it happen, but I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling too sympathetic that you just oh got back God. from Cabo, David. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to say, though. So thanks <laughs> for having me. Uh, it's been a long time coming. That's why I didn't sleep and went straight to this podcast, because it's been so long in the making. Oh, <laughs> we, appreciate it. we appreciate it. No guilt. <laughs> there it is. There it is. So, David, I want to I want to sort of dive in, you know, at this stage of the game with you guys. Right. Where you guys have built to where did you ever have a dream that it would be this big? That what you mm -hmm. created? Like, I mean, I think there's always the dream. Right. Like we want it to be. But then the reality comes. Right. Like, what, what's the just at a high level? What's the journey been like? Well, I, will, I don't know how to say this in a nice way, but I had a dream from the very beginning that it would be way, way, way bigger than it is today. And that was the only, it was a dream, right? Those things may not come true, but that was the only thing that really motivated me to start another company. So this is my fifth company, Drift. And um, man, I'm inherently lazy. And so I did not want to start another company. And so I had to believe deep down that this could be uh, massive, that this could actually last a very long time and maybe outlast me. And so that, that's why we started the company. But I will say that it had nothing, my belief in that had nothing to do with us, our product, the company, the team. It had to do with the problem and the size of the problem that we were trying to solve. I know Scott's sitting here going, wait a minute, this guy just said he's inherently lazy. How did he mm. do this? Right? Like that's, that is, because this is Scott's dream. This is Scott's dream. <laughs> How do, how do I get everybody else to work for me? Um, but so what, so when, but, but it's an interesting thing because we can get jaded in life and we can get, whether it's complacent or lazy or just tired, like you're tired of the grind. It's your, I think you say your fifth or your sixth? Fifth, fifth company. Fifth, right? Like that's a grind, right? That's like mm -hmm. being an SDR at five different companies every few years. Yeah. Not an easy thing to do. Mm. What, so what motivates you to get through the laziness? Well, a few things. I mean, we started Drift because we thought there's this problem that in some ways we helped create in the past in, uh, in, on the revenue side between marketing and sales and the buyer. And so we wanted to right that wrong. And then two, I think the other thing that really motivated myself and Elias was that we wanted to create this new kind of role model for a company. We wanted a very different place. We wanted a place, an equitable place, right? And, uh, and really create a role model for other companies because we had not experienced that in our time, you know? So I can go rant about diversity and equity and all that kind of stuff. But talk about, but talk about that. When you say a role model, what, what was, what is the role model you're setting? And, and, and it's okay to brag a little bit because <laughs> it is something, you know, I don't think anybody would take it as bragging. I think they would take it as like, yeah, I'm glad someone stepped up and, and let this charge. Yeah. I, so, you know, I think it go, it all goes back to history. I think, for myself, I always say like, I never, you know, I grew up in New York City and, uh, and I worked in New York City. My first startup was there and then moved to Boston. But in the first, you know, 10, 11 years of my career, I never worked with anyone that looked like me. I didn't, mm -hmm. this was pre-LinkedIn. So I didn't even know, you know, I imagined there was someone that looked like me, but I had never seen one. And that was in New York City. This was not, you know, in, in a small town. And yeah. so, you, but I never thought of anything of it. And then, you know, 11 years into it, I met Elias, who's my co-founder at Drift and my co-founder in my last company, and he's Nicaraguan. And so I was like, wow, it's someone like me. And so like, and of course, you know, we live in very different times and then I've been around for a long time. And so, you know, we, when we started the company, we started to hear from uh, Latinx people, people of color, you know, um, 
people, uh, you know, who felt, you know, like they didn't belong in certain places and, and they needed a role model. And so we wanted to try to be a role model for those individuals because Elias and I never had one uh, or never had any that looked like, like us. And so we wanted to do that. And then we thought we could become a role model as a company. And, you know, I think we, I spent a lot of time talking about this and thinking about it. So like, you know, I don't like, um, I think diversity is important, but I, don't, I think that misses the mark, that misses the conversation. I think the, the real thing that we're trying to do is, is to create an equitable environment and it's very different. So I think diversity can, is important and it's requirement step one, but you, know, you can build a diverse or you can think you're building a diverse environment just by having five of these and seven of these and three of these and whatever, but like, that doesn't mean that they have the same access, right? Those could be all junior SDRs, those could be all people in support, those could be in roles that never have the ability to progress within the company. And so for me, it's a long-term view on what we want to do. And it's really around, you know, creating an equitable environment. And if we can do that, and if we can be, our company can last in doing that, then maybe we can be a role model for some other companies who want to do the same thing. Do you think about that in terms of um, sort of acquiring capital and then deploying the capital back into the community to give folks these opportunities that, you know, are still rare now and we're maybe closer to non-existent kind of when you were coming up is that is that part of the yes i, I left that out in the i left that out that's the third part that's the third reason we started the company was that uh at least for elias and i we wanted to if any you know wanted to if anything happened who knows with the company we wanted to use any of those resources uh to in two different areas that we care about one of them obviously is underrepresented people in STEM. And we spend a lot of time personally, uh, philanthropically in that area. And we do as part of Drift as well through the, fund the foundation stuff we do there. And that's really focused on, you know, like middle school, high school, and a little bit of college, but it's really skewed younger because to solve the problem, you know, you have to have more. And so that has to start before someone's already in college and they've already sort yeah. of elected the, their path. And so we, yes, we do that. And that's an important reason why we started the company. So talk to us a little bit about, so does, is, is there a drift foundation? I, it mm -hmm. sounds like there is. Yeah, and we, we, yes, we funnel, what we tried to do as a company was that instead of, which I think, you know, we all, I have done in past companies, which is, you know, to, as different causes come up, you know, either that they, they come inbound or from internally from the team that we kind of take our resources and we sprinkle them a little here and a little there and a little um, everywhere that we wanted to focus our, you know, what we're doing at this specific problem. And, uh, and then, you know, that means that we put all our resources there, anything that we do there from, not only from a recruiting, from, um, you know, from, uh, organizations that we work with to get people in in and into the workforce within Drift, uh, but all the marketing stuff that we do, uh, uh, Elias does all this, and I do this kind of thing we call the American Dream. We do web, we do Latinx webinars. We do and we do that those with friends. We do constant sessions as well uh, that we do as well as financial that we would funnel it all in this area. And you know we've coached the team and explained to the team why we're doing this versus doing the traditional thing, which is sprinkling things across right. many. And did you, did you follow the, the Benioff model of one, one, one to create uh, or how did you, and, and I, let me, ex, you know, let me yeah. explain it for folks before you answer is that, you know, Benioff, um, when he first set up Salesforce, he knew early on he wanted to give back. And so he made sure that employees donate 1% of their time to uh, giving back. Right. And they, they, give people time to go do that on their own. Also their first day on the job, they actually do a, they do a, a not some kind of nonprofit work usually. And then also 1% um, get spread into their, into their foundation. So 1% of the money from Salesforce goes there. And I'm sure there's a, a better definition, but that's how he founded and funded it. And I know a lot of companies followed that. So I'm curious, did you follow that model or not quite that model or, you know? Yeah, I will say yeah. that, um, it's interesting, you know, uh, Benioff, Mark Benioff and Salesforce are both a role model from a company standpoint, but also from their foundation standpoint, the salesforce.org foundation that you mentioned and the 1% pledge, uh, but also, you know, our biggest, you know, um, com enemy, you know, as a right. company. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting, Weird. right? And so we didn't, I admire that plan. We didn't follow that to the T, 
but our plan is pretty similar of what we've done here. And Elias and I, as the founders, have have pledged well a lot more than one percent uh, to these causes so far. It's I didn't know that you and Elias had um, had partnered up more than once. So oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. I met him. I met Elias a long time ago. He worked for me as a VP of engineering at one of my companies in 2007, nine, and then was my co-founder in 2009 at Performable. Then we were at HubSpot together during the acquisition, and then we started Drift. So long, long history. Yeah. How has that dynamic um, evolved over the years, right? Is it like, do you fight like an old married, uh, you know, couple? Is everything, you know, smooth? Is one person like the innovator and one person the executor? Because this, this is a, a huge yeah. deal. And I'm, you know, I'm still trying to figure it out for yourself. That's right. I'm trying to figure out like, <laughs> how am I going to exist with Richard here for much longer? That's what I'm trying yeah. to do. So, uh, you know, it's an interesting relationship. I always tell people that, you know, from a personality standpoint, Elias and I are the most opposite people you can imagine. So I'm the super introvert and he is beyond extroverted. Like the mo one of the most extroverted uh, people that I know, you know, he cannot, if his family is gone, um, not home, he cannot even eat breakfast by himself. He has to go meet someone. He cannot, you know, be alone ever. And, uh, and I run to be alone. So like, then there's, that's not a full definition of extroversion and introversion, but like we are the most opposite. And then I tell people this, and then later they're like, wow, I've never met people who are the, you know, could be more opposite. But then from a value standpoint, that's where we're, we're pretty much the same. And so, but you know, personalities were opposites. I'd say, as, you know, when we started working together, it was a very much like mentor mentee kind of relationship. He didn't know anything about, he was coming from IBM. He didn't know anything about starting a company and doing all those things. That was my third company uh, by then, you know? And so, so we took on that relationship. We still have that in some ways. So like the, like he would defer to me on certain things, but like he is the, the person to go get things done. He is like the, he's a CTO, but he is the most extroverted sales oriented CTO on the planet. He's yeah. a, a frustrated salesperson. So his dream would be to be in sales. That's what gives <laughs> him energy. He does not, uh, yeah, it's amazing. So he's used that in many ways. He uses that obviously in selling to customers, but he also uses that as he's probably the, the biggest recruiting machine ever. Yeah. And, and he leads the front on all those kind of uh, extroverted activities and I'm, I'm more in the back. You now, know, how did, who, you, all, you all made a decision recently to go fully remote mm -hmm. for, for good. Mm -hmm. um, was that, did you arrive at that together? Like at the same time, did one of you kind of come to that conclusion first and then have to kind of warm the other person up to it, if you will? I'm, yeah. I'm curious how, how that decision evolved. Uh, I think it goes like most decisions. Like we had we talked about it for a long time. We talked about it long before even starting Drift. So like before we started Drift, we made the decision and we spent a lot of time talking about would, be, would we be a remote hybrid or in-office company and that we had to choose one and that we would try to steer clear of hybrid because the company that we worked with, uh, we worked together the first time, ended up being hybrid and it was, it was a poor experience. And, uh, and, uh, and I thought it led to actually inequity. So, which is a different topic. So like, I didn't want to do that. We chose this in office environment, obviously. And then, uh, then this happened, pandemic happened. And we learned a bunch of things. We learned that we could do all the things that we needed to do without having the office. We knew we could hire, we hired a CRO. The CRO has hired five people. We just hired a CCO, a CPO. We've never met any of these people in person. Like no. they've never been to an office. They've never met anyone at Drift. They've all had that. So like our, you know, our reality or like our limits were like shattered. And so like that led us to this place of being comfortable with it. I'd say Elias still wanted to be in office and uh, we debated it. And then I came back from, you know, the mountain one day and was like, I think we need to go to digital first. And we talked through it. And then that's how we got there. Yeah, I can assume you didn't seem to mind it as the introvert. <laughs> no. he, hated it as, he hates it as the extrovert, right? Yeah, although, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm so introverted, but it was like, it took me until like June or July. So like from February, late February, March to June and July, when I was like, I have to leave my house. I have right. to talk to someone like, right. I can't do it anymore. And right. so and it, by the time it hit me, I was like, wow, this must be insane for everybody else. 
because everybody else likes actually meeting and being with people. And it took me and it, it hit me faster than I thought, although that was a while. I thought I could go forever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any, anything short of forever is faster than we thought. Um, what What are the challenges, right? Because I know that culture, whether that's equity and diversity, I know how important culture is to you, an organizational mm -hmm. culture. And I think it's I think people are paying more attention to it now than they used to, right? How do you still maintain the drift culture? What advice would you give to a company? They're deciding to go digital remote. They're deciding to go yeah. remote first, all digital. What advice if you said, okay, if you're gonna do that, here are the three best ways you could maintain culture. And by mm -hmm. the way, don't do these things. Like, <laughs> don't hire a DJ for your SKO and expect everybody in there to <laughs> dance. Like that, you know, maybe it does work. I don't know. You know. Yeah, I think the, so, you know, we were lucky in that we were already almost, you know, six years old as of, as of January. So we had built, you know, a, a culture, a set of values, a set of rituals, uh, in the company, and we were lucky in that we were we had spent an insane amount of time for most people early on when we were tiny, defining our leadership principles, aka our values. You know, what do we hire? And then not only doing that, but living it. Do we hire? Do we fire based on it? Do we promote? Do we incent based on it? Like all that stuff. It's been a, we still still spend a lot of time in there. We spend a lot of time in building uh, a pretty tight onboarding and training and continual ed you know, process internally that turned into a product, which is called Drift Insider, which is, you know, like masterclass for marketing and sales that anyone can sign up for free. But we haven't, we use that internally. And we have also have internal only classes inside there. And everyone goes through that process. We, we invented a product called Drift Video, which, you know, we use for asynchronous communication. We did that long before the pandemic. And I can't tell you how much that product is used inside of Drift. And I think it's an important thing. And this was one thing that I would kind of suggest to people is that you start to move to asynchronous communication methods. Like we're doing a Zoom now. Define, define that word. Cause I, you know, yeah, asynchronous. I'm word, an engineer. Right? Yeah. There's synchronous video, which is what we're doing now. Zoom, it's live. So we're, we're having, it's basically a call. It's a video call. Then there's asynchronous video, which is you can use a product like Drift Video. You can use our friends at Vidyard. You can use Loom. You can use all these different products. And you record a video, just like almost this, like, you know, one person conversation, and then you share it with a group of people. The reason that's important is that, and we discovered this kind of over time, was that as you add more people, obviously you can share those artifacts that you've created, those videos. Uh, as you go to a remote only environment or digital first environment, uh, people don't have to gather at the same time, in the same time zone, you know, uh, to actually digest or watch the video. And it helps, it also helps people who are more of like me, who are a processor, who have to digest stuff before they can react to it. So it helps all these people. And it, it helps on the equity side because there, there's gonna be people who are, you know, you know, in different time zones and different places around the world that there's gonna be people who have to care for their parents, for their kids, for their loved ones. There's gonna be all sorts of things that come up in life. And you wanna make sure that you create an equal playing field and that it's not only the people who can show up at 9 a.m. East, you know, Eastern Standard Time to the live Zoom meeting that are, you know, promoted or celebrated. Yeah, that's great. That, that's yeah. really cool. So just start, you, you mentioned something, I'm going to turn it back to Scott, but you talked about culture, values, and rituals. Right? I love the word ritual there. That's, that's what I'm going to, is like, super important one. define, you know, this is what we think culture means. Mm -hmm. Here's how we express that in our values. Mm -hmm. And then here are the rituals we do to support that. Because I really like what you said there. Sure. I think, you know, for us, and everyone has a different definition, culture is, for me, it's only, it's always been like, it's the sum of the people currently within the team, within the group, within the organization at that time. And as you add more people and as years and the context changes, uh, the culture is gonna change. It's not a static thing because it's the sum of the people. And then it is, you know, from a value standpoint, it's the, you know, actions that you um, promote, that you applaud, and then the actions that you won't tolerate. And it's that second part that's the most important part when defining, uh, when defining this. Because I think everyone can say, oh, here are the values that we aspire to, and we want this and X, Y, Z. But very, very, very few companies in the world 
are willing to fire based on those values. And the minute that you're not willing to live the value and you're not willing, even if someone is the top salesperson, top engineer, top whatever, if you're not willing to live the value, then those things are hollow. Everyone will know that and that becomes your new culture, right? And so that's very important. And then on ritual standpoint, you know, we, and we were lucky as well moving to digital first because we had a set of rituals within the company. You could think, you know, others would look at rituals and say they're gatherings or meetings, you know, they're like these, these and they are live. Um, and we have a set of them that we follow, but they're not, it's not about the meeting. It's more time for people to come together where we keep a certain structure, certain cadence, so that new people coming in and existing people know for X, Y, Z, for this feeling, for, uh, for collaboration, for coming together, for celebration, we always do this thing. And it's those things that those rituals develop over time, they get reinforced and they start to take a life of their own. We have something called um, show and tell every Friday where, you know, different people from every team across every functional group within the company stand up and, you know, uh, do a presentation basically on what that team accomplished that week. And all of it has to be customer impacting, not pretend stuff that, you know, we did internal, but it impacts the customer. That has become a competition. It's almost like a game show. It's self-organizing. No executive organizes it. Uh, you know, there's prizes, there's awards. It's the most fun thing ever. That happens every Friday. That's one of our key rituals that we have. That's cool. Who came up with that idea? I came up with it when I was at HubSpot as a way, and I was leading product, product engineering and design, and I came up with it as a way to communicate to the internal customers. So what happens in most organizations and most product organizations is that you, this kind of, these walls get erected between the product engineering team and the sales and service and support and marketing teams, and then mistrust comes in. And so what I wanted to do was force you know, our team to always speak in customer terms. So they were not allowed to ever show anything that was in staging or only worked on their laptop or a demo or a screenshot or anything. It had to be live for customers, even if it was a small set of beta customers. And what that did, and, and so we had this, there was monthly, here we do a weekly. It was a celebration. The whole company would come. We'd have ice cream and tacos and what, you know, it was like a big thing. And, you know, the whole executive team would always be there. You know, Brian Darmesh, would, you know, who were the founders would be sitting in the front of the thing and applauding. And all of a sudden it became this thing where it was for transparency, but, you know, the, I would hear the engineers and the product teams competing with themselves. Like, what are we going to present this month? We look like chumps last month. Like, we got to do, like, it was a really because it was their time to get recognition, but it also developed trust because the internal teams could clearly see, go to market teams, what the engineers were working on in customer terms, which is what they care about. I would imagine this is one kind of unique way that a, um, a more junior level kind of employee could end up on your radar and, mm -hmm. and get noticed, uh, for example. Because so what I was gonna ask was, is there something that a, a salesperson or a sales manager, frontline kind of sales manager can do at a company of your size to get on your radar, to get, to get noticed, to have the opportunity to build some kind of um, relationship? Because our audience is primarily sales leaders, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, and, uh, and, and, and frontline you know, reps. So I get asked that question all the time, like, hey, I'm a rep. How can I get on you know, the CEO's radar? How does the CEO even know who I am? So, yeah, I'm, so I mean, that's one way. What, what, are, what else could somebody do? I'm kind of religious on this. So like, um, I have an opinion on this. The show and tell, I'll just say, is one of the best ways ever because it's always a rotating person that gets picked. Actually, they have to volunteer within the team. I don't even know how it's organized. I don't organize it. It's self-organizing. And uh, so it's always a different person. It could be a BDR, a BDR manager. It could be a sales leader. It could be all over. One rule that we have is that we don't let uh, C-level people or executives present, right? It has to be the team. Uh, so like the teams present. And so all the time people get on not only my radar, but everyone else's radar, different leaders within the group. And, and it also forces, you know, in a happy way, collaboration to happen. Cause, oh, look, I didn't know Scott was working on that project. Let me go talk to him about that. I have a customer who wants that. Let me go talk to him. So like stuff you would never see before because it's in a fun environment versus, yeah. you know, some, some weird email that goes around. I'd say that's one. I'd say, you know, like when I said I'm religious about this, you know, I get this question all the time. 
and I'm, you know, faced with it on the other side. And one thing that I would say is I recorded a podcast episode a million years ago on my podcast called Carry the Water, which is applicable here, which is basically the, that you as a young, you know, person coming into the company, a young leader or a young BDR, you need to first carry the water, AKA you need to put some points on the board. You have to show some mastery of what you have before you're worried about recognition. And so many times, people want to skip that part. They want to, you know, I always used to, when I was at HubSpot and to go back there, we used to have these uh, MBA uh, Sloan kid, uh, from Sloan MIT come in. And I know what day they would come in because it, on the first day, within the first hour, I would get 20 emails from all of them. Hey, <laughs> David, do you, have ten, you, do you have time to do lunch this week? And I'd be like, and so I would reply immediately. I'd be like, no. And they'd be like, what? You have not done anything yet. I don't have time to do lunch with you. You have to actually have an impact. You have no understanding of what we do as a company. You have not helped our customers. You have not done anything. You have not collaborated. What are we going to talk about? And so I say the same thing to people within Drift or people within other companies. Do something, stand out, you will get recognized. Don't worry so much about how do you get recognized. You, if your work is excellent, believe me, you will get recognized. Although that doesn't sound real when you're on the other end wanting to get recognized. Yeah. Does, this, does this mentality carry over with you to um, brand building, for example, and you know, people kind of wanting to uh, show up and be thought leaders and, and be on every podcast and write, you know, essays all over the place. Um, <clears throat> yes, yes, and that's that's definitely you know even within our company, it's a we have a process for doing that. We have you know a podcast and then a set of podcasts. Uh, that, you know, is part of our, our network, one around product, one around operations and marketing, et cetera. And, um, but we have an audition process. We have a whole process that you have to go through before one of them becomes official. But we have people all the time who come and start and want to start a podcast of their own or this or that or whatever. I, you know, the, the thing that worries me about it is that often it's, it's an ego issue and, it's, and then you'll see it come up in other it's not that the podcast is wrong or they want to be a thought leader or this kind of stuff. It's usually that they're too, the ego is out of, is a little bit out of whack. And so, you know, uh, that always is one of the, you know, one of the signs that we look for. What, is, do, what do you mean the ego's out of whack? Like I, I, I can kind of visualize it, but mm -hmm. like, with, you know, without throwing any person under the bus, like what are the things that tell you, Hey, this, this person might need some coaching on their ego. Yeah. So, you know, it's an important thing because it's one of the things we think about the most within Drift, because as a company, we want to, one of our leadership principles is that we want to build the company as a learning machine. And we want every single person within the company to be a learning machine, to continue to progress and grow. And that if we can do that, if all of them can continue to do that, all of us within the company, then the company can continue to learn, do better for the customer, and then that will drag the company forward. And so, but, you know, the reason that, you know, the, ego, the balance between ego and humility is important is because when the ego takes over, and we all have egos, uh, that is the point where you cannot hear anymore, right? Because it's about you. It's about me. I, I want this podcast. I want to do this. I want to write this thing. I want to, I, I, I. And once you get it, or I want to create this, entrepreneurs have it all the time. I've had it a million. I want to create this idea. I want this company. I want, as soon as you start doing that, so I, and I listen for that I, me, I, me kind of word all the time when people talk, then you cannot hear anymore. You cannot hear from the customer. You cannot hear from the market. You can't hear feedback anymore because you're lost on kind of manifesting some idea, something that you see as some personal representation of your, of you, you know, at the end of the day. And so that, that becomes dangerous if you can't control it. And I think, you know, I can go on an ego forever. I think, you know, one of the things that was always odd to me is that people misinterpret or misdefine ego, in my opinion. You know, a lot of times people, when they're talking about someone has an ego, they're talking about like, is this person nice or not? And that has nothing to do with ego, right? Like, you know, some of the craziest, hardcore, not nice competitors in the world were the most humble. And you could see that because over time they kept being coached, they kept getting better, they kept growing. And if the ego was truly taking over, they would have stalled and they could never continue to grow, right? Their talent would not be enough at some point. They had to be coachable, in other words. I, I totally get this and I always have to carry Scott and I'm really tired of carrying Scott. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> you're back. I see you. You're hunched over from all the weight. I know. Now, what I always tell people, and you should tell Scott, is like, I don't mind carrying a man, but please <laughs> lift your feet and don't drag your feet while I carry you. Right. <laughs> I'm still working on it. I'm still trying. I'm still trying. But you, I can, I can imagine this, what we, what you just talked about being a big part of this answer, but I'm going to ask you to try to find sure. a, different, a different angle to it. So mm -hmm. outside of like the ego and being too much about me, 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 um, what are some of the things that drive you nuts about working with revenue leaders? What are, what, what are the what are the ways if a revenue leader is listening right now mm -hmm. outside of being me 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 uh and missing numbers badly let's, <laughs> yeah. let's eliminate those things what are what are some of the you know what are some of the no-nos right what, what are some of the things that that drive you crazy with you know sales leaders marketing mm -hmm. leaders whatnot um and therefore so they can listen and be like okay i need to not be that way I need to yeah. go this direction. I'd say number one, the, for, for us and for me, is the key is that they're not focused on the customer, right? They're focused on the company problem, their problem, their team problem, whatever. For us, we always orient around the customer. That's an important guardrail in, in our world and in our company. It's the reason we exist, right? The business, as Drucker would say, business only exists to serve a customer. There is no other thing for uh, another reason for a business to exist as an entity. So that's the only thing we're here for, to do. So like if they're not really customer oriented, if they're always optimizing for themselves or for their team ahead of the customer, that would be number one. Two, would, we mentioned already, which is like that they're, you know, the ego and they're not willing to learn and they, they have all the answers. It's like, you know, the older I get, I don't know if this is true for you guys, the less I, less I know that I don't know. Like, I don't know anything. I used to think I knew everything. I know nothing now. Right. And uh, I know a very little tiny thing, you know, and yeah. that's about it. And I'm constantly trying to learn and add to it. So like we don't know anything. And um, and so like if they don't learn and do that. And then the third, uh, which is super important to me, and it's kind of universal across all leaders, but especially revenue leaders, is that that they don't really have a tight relationship with their team. They don't really understand what their team is doing. They never, they may sit up here and they never like, yeah. you know, inspect and go and figure out what's motivating, talk to, you know, the BDR, talk to their sales leaders, talk to their sales managers. Like they're always operating up here and they're managing spreadsheets and they're That's managing right. things that they, they talk about strategy and spreadsheets. And it's just like, you know, the truth is always outside the building. The truth is always in your team. The truth is never in a spreadsheet, in a chart, in a report, in a, it's never. That is the that is the rearview mirror, right? David, Data I don't, David, I don't, David, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a new title, uh, and it's called the VP of Spreadsheets. <laughs> new title. Uh, I've met a lot of them for that type of leader. Yeah, yeah, the yeah dashboard like manager. Dashboard manager. So I've seen a lot of uh, you know revenue leaders like that, and it's like data is rearview mirror, right? It's not going to tell you where we're going, right? And so you can make some predictions on it, but most of the predictions will be wrong. You have to have ways, early signals that let you see ahead. And that's usually the customer in your team. That's going to let you see it forward. Just out of curiosity at, at your company, right? Mm -hmm. I love what you said about, you know, the revenue leader needs to be customer oriented. Yeah. How often have you ever talked to a head of sales or asked a head of sales or a revenue team? And even in your organization, you know, when was the last time you spoke to a customer six months after they signed a contract? Do you ever ask that kind of question? Like you seem like the you person who would. And, and more importantly, do you require that? Like, do you make your VPs as, you know, part of their MBOs, you know, go write two use cases on two customers from a year ago or something like, how, how do you instill that? I guess is the question. Uh, yes and yes. And not only on the revenue side, but I, it's important for us across every role in the company, including engineers, designers, product people, people who typically wouldn't talk to even people in, in our, you know, finance team, uh, people who naturally wouldn't talk to the customer. We build guardrails and we measure that to make sure that they are, because that's again, where the truth is and that's who we're here to serve. But like from a revenue leader, do I ask that? Yeah, all the time. Uh, you know, if it's not weekly, it's bi-weekly. I'm asking that. And they're asking that of the people on the other team. They're asking that of our marketing team. They're asking that of everyone, you know? And so like, you know, that's one of my first questions that I'm asking when someone is proposing something, whether it's a, you know, a leader, revenue leader proposing a new initiative or going into a new segment or a new location or, 
or a product person doing it or anyone talking about it, the first thing I want to talk about is like, you know, how many customers have they talked to? How many prospects? Like, what are they learning? I just want to hear the anecdotal stuff. I want to hear like, I want to hear the stories of what they're hearing. And if they haven't done that, that's when we stop. So that's like the first filter, you know? And then on the flip side for leaders, revenue leaders and others, you know, when we're talking about their team, one of my habits is to always go down like three levels down and ask a question about like, you, what is Scott doing? You know, Scott is, you know, three levels down below Richard and uh, Richard, what is Scott doing? Uh, I don't know. Nothing. The last time you talked doing to him. Nothing. He's riding on my coattails <laughs> and my shoulders. And then the next thing, when was the last time you talked to him? Uh, I'm busy. Da, 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 I don't know. Last month. And then I'd be like, why are we talk? Why are we having a meeting to talk about your team? Like you don't know anything about what's happening on your team. You have to inspect. You have to talk to people on the team. And so I do that from a customer standpoint, but also from an internal people standpoint. Now you're looking. Are you looking for answers? Like, okay, Richard is working on this. Richard is at eighty percent to target right now. Or are you mm -hmm. interested in in information like Richard's going through some things right now. His family's got this going on. He's working on, you know, his mindset. We're compartmentalizing things. His performance is this. Are you looking for the latter, or the or the former? I'm I'm looking for the latter. I could care less about the this number and that number. I can read a report just like anybody else. So I don't need someone to tell yeah. me that. I want to know that they're actually talking to them because they could tell me about their numbers and this and that, and they've heard that from a sales manager or one of their VPs or someone else, they don't actually know. I wanna hear the real story about what's happening. What is this person motivated at? What do they wanna do next? What's the problem that they're having? What are we doing? It's interesting, it's almost like, you know, when the, mat, when the numbers really don't matter, right? Mm -hmm. Interesting approach. Um, mm -hmm. as I'm thinking. I wanna come back to the equity piece that you talked about and the equitable, sure. um, which we hear a lot and diversity and to your point, equity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some of that equity, in some places it starts with education, right? Getting to the yes. younger kids so that they can get to that equitable place. How do you guys do equity? Like if you can share that, does, does, does it, are salaries open and everybody knows what everybody makes on their team or mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you really help be equitable? Yeah, so a whole bunch of, it starts with a whole bunch of reporting to go to the VP of spreadsheets, but we look at one we have and we spend a lot of time and we try to be super thoughtful around uh, never having, not having ad hoc kind of uh, goals for people, ad hoc salaries, ad hoc equity, you know, any of those things. And so that we spend a lot of time devising bands and levels and, and, and then measuring within every single, you know, from associate designer to like BDR to like every rung. And those are transparent for the people in those roles, right? They know, you know, what the bands are, what they need to do, what they need to execute, what the rubric is that they need to fulfill in order to get to the next step. That's important. Then, on the, then we are measuring from, from a diversity standpoint, you know, are, do we have, you know, do, are people getting, you know, do we have any bias in there? You know, are people not being able to get to a certain level, get to a certain salary, get hired into a certain role, all those kind of things. And we're, and we're super transparent about that as well. And those numbers internally, we publish some of that stuff externally. And then we spend a lot of time talking to other companies, benchmarking and looking at that stuff. You know, I think the easier stuff to, to work on is the diversity stuff, you know, uh, that's easier because that you can run a report, you can do that stuff. The hard thing to work on is the thing that that we're focused on, which is equity, because that will take a very long time. And in, in, because in some roles, you're creating, you're bringing people like like myself, you know, who may have never been in this kind of role before, right? Like in, in an engineering role, let's say. And so, like you're bringing a whole wave of people, and as you can imagine, that's going to take a, a long time. That's not going to be, you know, uh, next quarter we're going to solve that that equity problem. So, like we're doing it. That's why we invest in the in the high school and younger kind of age range. We're bringing them into the business. We're, we're trying to create roles for them. And it, it's hard, hard work. And it's probably why nobody wants to talk about that piece. How do you educate your sales team? Totally different question. Sure. On life skills, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you come across as one of these leaders on life skills. Scott's been a real strong advocate sure. at least the last six months, but definitely the last two or three of like really teaching people things like What's the magic number in startups? Mm -hmm. All this stuff that nobody teaches us, right? Or even if it's what it means to be financially independent, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I get a sense that this is a part of your culture. Right? Uh, a very, very, very intricate part of our culture. And I spend a lot of time doing that internally. I also spend it externally. I volunteer at some business schools here in Boston and they're the highest of the highest business schools, but they don't teach any of this either. They don't teach you how to lead a team. They don't teach you how to hire a team. They don't teach you how to market. They don't teach you how to sell. They don't, it's just like, I don't know what you learn, but like, and I, I tell them this. So like, so, and uh, you know, if you don't know those things. Uh, and so internally, the way I do it and the way we do it is that we have a whole bunch of different things. We have, obviously we have external podcasts that are dedicated to learning and progression. We have internal, I film internal uh, courses, videos, podcasts. I do that with Elias and other people on the team to help people with different life skills. We have a, what we call the Drift Book Club. I'm obsessed with reading and I talk about reading a lot. Before we go into the book club, what kind of life skills are you coaching people? Because I, I want other leaders who are listening to this to understand how important this is. That oh my God. It's, uh, you know, the, the surprising part of it is how much you have to do, how much people need this part. And so like the, the breadth is like, is crazy. Every day I'm coming, you know, we're coming up with an, another thing to help people with. It could be anything like financial education right? Just like educating them personal financial education, yeah. right? Like that they don't, that no one's ever taught anyone, sure. um, you know, how to save, uh, how to, you know, like you said, what's a magic number? What are CAC metrics? How do we hire? How do we fire? How do we, you know, how do we interview someone? I do. How do we interview someone? How do we, how do you conduct the meeting? How do you do like the, you would, in some ways you would laugh, you know, but how basic some of these things are, but people have never been taught this. So why do we expect people to know it? I totally get it. And I've, I've been a huge advocate of this for, for years. Like I would bring in real estate agents and, mm -hmm. and loan officers to teach people about the home buying process. Yeah. I brought in a psychologist to literally just talk about therapy and mm -hmm. what the benefits are. I brought in a mindfulness coach. I brought in a wealth manager, all of these, these kind of things. What you realize is none of, nobody ever fucking taught us how to be an adult. That's what you realize. Yeah. Nobody. No. There's, we didn't go, we didn't go to school for adulting and that's what we all, that's what we all need. And I just found that, you know, um, is a, is a good way to like give back to my team and they were hungry for the, the information mm -hmm. and, you know, better people are going to sell better. So like, how can I help my team just be more well-rounded? Right. And, and this is a, it felt like an easy kind of fun way to participate and coach and train and, and, and educate. Yeah, I think you, one important thing that you said at the end there that that I really I think about all the time is that that in business that for some reason we try to convince ourselves that there are these that they're two different people, right? We're going to train them around business and that's not our business over here, that's personal. There's only one thing, right? Like there's no business is a fake construct again just organized or a, a, you know to serve customers. There is no business. There's no living thing called a business. There are only people and people have habits. They have biases. They have ways that they make decisions, good, yeah. bad, and how they make mistakes. Those are all the same. The same way that you do things in your personal life, pretty much going to be the way you do it in your business life. There's no magic on off switch that you can become a totally different person. Uh, and so like we, it's important for us to teach people how to form habits, how to make, you know, how to write, how to do a presentation. How to, you know, like all of these things, you know, like how to appeal to someone, you know, we talk about, I talk about that from a marketing and human decision-making stuff all the time on our external podcast, but a lot more internally. And I do a course around that, but like, because that is how we all make decisions. It's just not from a selling standpoint. It's not from, uh, you know, a business standpoint. It's how we make personal decisions as well. I think this is great. And, you know, I, I'm so bummed because we have to, we actually have to wrap it. Oh, yeah. And like, we're out of time. But you've been like, first of all, I don't know who ever said you were an introvert. Like, I don't get it. <laughs> Me. Um, you, just, you just got to get them going. Right. Oh, my God. Going. Yeah. You're That's most introverts. introverts are like that. Yeah. You're not introverted once you're talking to somebody. But they just if they had to choose, you'd rather, you know, slurk off into the corner a little bit. Right. You know? it, right. it is I why it. I, you know, I grew up as an engineer, software engineer, and I interviewed so many software engineers and I developed this weird way that I interview people now which is basically because most of them tended to be super introverted in most in a lot of cases, way more introverted than me. And so I needed to get them talking. And so like, I basically, my interview style is I just ping pong around like, a, like anything, you know, like, Hey, do you like skiing? Oh, no. Okay. 
You know, <laughs> what did you do this weekend? You know, what was your favorite no. food? You like Chinese food? And then I'm looking for them to light up and start talking. Yeah. And once you hit something that they're passionate about, they can't stop talking. Yeah. And so like, that is how I get the interview process working. So I do that with everyone now. So they must think that I'm crazy and that I can't stay on one subject, but I'm, I'm trying to get a read at what do they look like? What does Richard look like when he's excited, when he's motivated, because he's talking about something he's personally passionate about. Then we switch to a professional context and I try to see if they're equally as self-motivated around that. Oh, that's interesting technique. I like that. <laughs> so we want to give a quick shout out before we ask our, our wrap up question to uh, Lead 411, uh, Wingman, Salesforce Revenue Cloud and Vidyard for supporting us on the podcast. We really appreciate their support. Please go check them out. Um, what what can we do to help you, David? What you know, God, I can't imagine. Tell people to, anything, but what kind of advice do you have to you? <laughs> Tell people to use Drift. That's use a great. Drift. All right, yeah. so we we can make that work. Actually, that, that's how, how do I get my hands on one of those T-shirts? Is that uh, it? I just need a mailing address and a um, your size for Very both perfect. of you. We'll I have it. I will rock that shirt and support you. Oh, right. I'm gonna, I'll send you a bunch of limited run stuff. I'm a frustrated uh, clothing designer. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's the, we've got all the way to the end to get the title of the episode. I'm a frustrated clothing right. designer by Dave. Yeah, I am. <laughs> well, thanks Dave. so much for spending some time with us, David. We really appreciate yeah, this it. This is awesome. Thank you. I love so it. Much. Thank you, guys. All right, talk to you soon. All right, cheers. Bye-bye.